Good evening, church. Good evening. The Lord is good. All the time. And all the time. The Lord is good, and that's his nature. Uh, we are happy to come uh, for this week of prayer, which started on Sabbath, and uh, now we are on Wednesday. We thank God for the Father that he has led us, and we thank him for this opportunity that he has allowed us to come and listen to his word once more. We are going to start our evening of worship, and uh, in front of you, uh, my name is Beryl Owia, and I have my sister Ellen, she'll say hi. Hi. And we have our pianist Collins, you can say hi. Amos, sorry, Amos. Um, we will re have a word of prayer from Ellen before we start. Let us believe and pray. Dear Lord, we come before you uh, this evening as we are going to start this service. We pray that may you lead us even as we're going to sing for you. We pray that may you give us voices, Lord, that you may lift your name high. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Uh, we're going to start with hymn number 206, face to face with Christ my Savior. Um, our next hymn will be hymn number 92. 
And this was given by Wendy uh, because she came in good time. So if you come in good time, you have an option of giving us a lovely choice. So we will sing hymn number 92, This Is My Father's World. Jesus Savior pilot me 551 cities that he may lead us all the way. Our next hymn will be 428, Sweet By and By, 428. In a little while, uh, sorry, 428, Sweet By and By, there's a land that is fairer than day. Prepare. 
meet on the beautiful shore. We shall sing on the beautiful shore the melodious songs of the blessed, and the spirit shall soar no more. Not a sigh for the blessings of rest in the sweet. showing up in our cities and we welcome the pulpit team thank you for seeing it good evening church good evening the Lord is good, and all the time, thank you, the Lord is good, and that's his nature, but you do not sound as though the Lord is good, and indeed, that is his nature. Perhaps, uh, you know, we could repeat that, the Lord is good, and all the time, indeed, the Lord is good, and that's his nature. It is indeed a blessing to be in the house of the Lord yet again. To come and listen to the messages that the Lord has prepared for us. It is my prayer that uh, we will be blessed, we will all be blessed, even as we continue to fellowship together. Please allow me to ask, particularly for those who are sitting on the very far end, will you very kindly move towards the front so that the pastor can speak to us you know, uh, from a point where he can see the whole church and so that we're not sitting, you know, too far in the back. Please come to, towards the front. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate uh, your cooperation. Thank you very much. Indeed, we thank the Lord that we are in his house yet again. Uh, thank you all for making it uh, to this program. We praise God for traveling messes, allowing us all to be here in a very special way, equally special. We want to also welcome our online audience who are worshiping with us, our online worshipers. Uh, we invite you uh, to, uh, to be at the feet of Jesus as we listen to the service this evening. May I ask, would we have any visitors amongst us? Do we have any visitors by show of uh, hand? Right, perhaps we have not invited visitors to the session. Please invite a friend to tag along, a neighbor, a workmate to come and listen to the blessings that the Lord has for us. It is our call to go out and minister to those around us, and we should endeavor to do this every time we come to the house of the Lord and even when we are not here. So once more, welcome to this uh, service. Uh, perhaps let me begin by introducing the team that is serving this evening. Um, we will be led uh, in the corporate prayer segment by Sister Dina. Would you please greet the church? 
Thank you. Uh, we will uh, have the scripture reading done by Sister Rachel. Thank you. I believe she's behind the pillar. Our program manager for this uh, uh, evening is uh, Sister Melissa. Thank you. And uh, our speaker, who has been speaking with us uh, to us for the last uh, uh, four days now, is uh, Pastor Colin uh, Mappa. Uh, Pastor uh, Mappa has blessed us with the messages that he has continued to share, the messages that the Lord has prepared for us. It, indeed, it is indeed a blessing that we can come to the house of the Lord to come and worship and listen to these messages. Um, I also want to welcome uh, amid us uh, our pastor. Uh, pastor, please uh, rise up and greet the congregation. We're glad to have you. Amen. Thank you very much, Pastor. Our choristers, thank you very much. Our pianists, our choristers, uh, for the wonderful singing. We praise God uh, for your service, and uh, may he bless you as you continue to minister in his house. At this point in time, I would now um, invite uh, my sister to take us through the next part of the program. But once more, Pastor, we welcome you in a very special way. We ask that the Lord uh, may bless you and continue to bless you, even as you minister uh, to us, and that he may continue to use you mightily in the messages that God is sharing with us. Thank you and good evening. We welcome you all to this service. Good evening, church. I'll now invite the choristers for our theme song 612. Welcome. Let's all rise.
Good evening. Yeah, time for corporate prayers. And I would like us to go into groups of three. I'll give you 10 minutes. And after that, I'll close with a word of prayer. Kindly, let's move to the group of threes. 10 minutes.
let's bow our heads forward of prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, we come unto this time. We give you glory and honor for each one of us. Thank you, Lord, for enabling all of us to come, Father, to worship you, O Lord. We pray for your blessings. Thank you, Father, for these prayers that have been offered with each and every individual. We pray, O Lord, that we may meet each one of them at their points of need, O King of Glory. I want to remember those who have come here and they're not feeling well. You are the great physician. May you touch them. May you heal them. There are those who have financial challenges. We pray for financial breakthrough in the name of Jesus Christ. There are those, O oh Lord, who have different challenges. Maybe it is family issues and many more. We pray that we may come through for them. In a special way, Lord, we want to present this country and this nation into able hands. We pray for our leaders that, Lord, you may lead them, grant them knowledge and wisdom that comes from above. I want to present our families, wherever they are, that, Lord, you may protect them and cover them with the blood of Jesus Christ, O King of glory. May you guide each one of us, O Father, that when we get out of this house, O Father, that, Lord, our prayers will be answered, O Father, and let we be done. I want to dedicate our pastor in tribal hands as he comes to give us your word. We pray, O King of glory, that you may guide him. May, may your Holy Spirit be with, be with each and every one of us. May your princes be with us, O Lord. Be with us now and forever, for this is our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our scripture reader, Rachel. Good evening. Okay, our scripture reading comes from the book of Judges, chapter 1, verse 19. Are we there? I'll read. The Lord was with the men of Judah. They took possession of the hill country, but they were unable to drive the people from the plains because they had iron chariots. I read again. Judges 1.19. The Lord was with the men of Judah. They took possession of the hill country, but they were unable to drive the people from the plains because they had iron chariots. Uh, the pastor will expand on this. I'll call the, um, the choristers to lead us with the theme song. Number 612, Onward Christian Soldiers.
Good evening, church. Good evening, church. I'm looking at somebody, and that somebody's looking at me, but not responding. Good evening, church. Ah, she has responded now. Uh, thank you for responding. May God bless you for that. Mungu ni mwema. Siku zote. Now what does that mean? <laughs> he saves. Oh, good. Teach me some of that after church. That will be exciting. Our text has been read. So allow me to pray so that we uh, see what the Lord has to say to us tonight. Heavenly Father, we come before your throne this evening thanking you for the love that we saw the whole of today and for allowing us to make it here and our brothers and sisters who have joined us virtually, we pray for blessings for all of us that as your word will be read, your spirit may speak to all of us so that we may be better prepared for our tomorrow. This is our humble prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We read from the book of Judges. We read from the book of Judges, and verse number 19 says, And the Lord was with Judah. The Lord was with Judah. And he drove out the inhabitants of the mountain, but could not drive out the inhabitants of the valley. And the reason is given because they had chariots of iron. Our subject this evening, I have seen chariots of iron. Now, because some of you are too serious, I'll ask you to tell your neighbor the same one title. I have seen chariots of iron. Yes, may God bless the reading of his word. The book of Judges comes uh, soon after the book of Deuteronomy. Joshua took over for the book of Joshua, Deuteronomy, Joshua, and Joshua. This time when we get to the book of Judges, Joshua is dead. And um, when Moses was handing over leadership to Joshua, we read in the book of Deuteronomy that he laid his hands, Moses laid his hands on Joshua. But when Joshua dies, we don't see that happening. And so the children of Israel have to approach God by tribes. So when you read the entire book of Judges, you can call it the canonization of Israel. Israel is moving from the wilderness as a people of God, led by Moses and Joshua, obedient to the laws of God. But the moment they settle in the promised land, things start happening. And so Israel, instead of making sure that the God they worship is known in Canaan, the other way things happened. The Canaanites were successful in convincing Israel that there are other gods save for the one God you have in heaven. And so when you study the book of uh, Judges, you will notice that it's showing two extremes. Obedience and blessings on one side, sin and punishment on the other. These are the two extremes that you will see if you study the book of Judges. And obedience and blessings cannot be divorced. And God blesses those who obey. And that's what he promises. And he also promised to punish those who sin. So those two extremes, you will find them in the book of Judges. There is a cycle when you read the book of Judges, there is a cycle that keeps coming over and over and over again. What is that cycle? Israel does evil before God. 
And then God gives them over to their enemies. And then Israel is oppressed for whatever number of years that's specified. And then during that oppression, Israel cries to God. And then God hears Israel and he raises up a deliverer. Let's give him a name, Samson. And that deliverer rises, he redeems Israel from their oppressors. And then a time of peace and quiet comes because they are now back to their houses. They are free. The oppressor has been taken away and they are free. And because of that freedom, Israel sins again. And when Israel has sinned again, because God loves his people so much, he gives them over again to their enemies. And their enemies oppress them. And so that cycle keeps coming over and over again. Let me show you. Judges chapter 3, verse 12. I'll be reading in your hearing. Judges chapter 3, verse number 12. The Bible says, And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. Chapter 4, verse 1. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. Chapter 6, verse 1. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. Chapter 10, verse 6. Chapter 10, verse number 6. And the children of Israel did evil again. In the sight of the Lord. Chapter number 13, verse 1. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. So it was now a habit. God sets them free. They relax. They look for other gods. And because God loves them, he sends them to oppression and they live under oppression. When they cry, God loves them still. He sets them free from the oppressor. But because of peace and quiet and ease, they do evil again in the sight of the Lord. What you need to understand is that the life of Israel at this point in time is your life and mine. We keep doing evil again and again. God forgives us, we do it again, and God forgives us, and we do it again and again. This is your life, this is mine. But what we need to understand is that this sin, this habit of repeating sin is dangerous to our spirituality. Are we together, church? Sin broke the heart of God. If you want to know what sin did, it broke the heart of God. And when you see Jesus, you picture him hanging on the cross. You need to be convinced of the depth, the breadth, and the height of his love for you. And that love for you must make you not to sin. Are we together, church? If you love God so much, then you will remember what sin did to his son on the cross. From eternity past, Jesus had never cried to his father to say, why have you left me? But because of sin, he cried, my father, my father, why have you left me? So for a moment, the son was separated from his father. And that is because of sin. Christ is hanging on the cross, carrying the sins of the world. And because of that, his father cannot look at him. He envelops him in darkness, turns his back on his son and Jesus Christ. That is what sin did to your savior. And because you love your savior so much, you don't sin for fear of consequences. You sin, you don't sin because you love God. Do we tell the difference? You don't sin because you are afraid of consequences, but you don't sin because you love Christ. And you know what sin did to him. So Paul says every time you commit sin, you are crucifying Christ afresh. So sin broke the heart of God. And you need to know that uh, 
worsens. Sin worsens in degree. Do you know when you, you are used to sinning, you start with small things. The thief that you know, probably jailed now, he didn't start with the big things. He started small. But because he kept doing it and kept on doing it, the sin grew worse in degree. Cheating does not start by cheating. It starts by having a number in your phone of a person you know is interested in you, but you are married. That's why it starts small. And the next thing, you are getting out of the house to receive calls from that other person. Sin grows worse in degree. Are we together, church? So Ellen White says in the book called Signs of the Times, page 18, paragraph 2, every success gained places us on a higher round of the ladder of progress and it gives us spiritual strength for fresh victories. You build momentum in overcoming sin. Every time you, you overcome sin, you are placed on a higher round of progress and it gives you power to overcome again. But the opposite is also true. Mind, character, and personality, volume 2, page 795. Every repetition of the sin weakens the power of resistance. It blinds the eyes and stifles your conviction. Every time you sin, you are weakening your power to resist. And you are blinding your eyes and you are stifling your conviction. Let me, let me explain to you what stifling conviction means. I grew up in the village. So I would see my grandmother taking, you know clay pots? taking a clay pot that has been on the fire for hours. She uses her bare hands, bare hands. She holds it and she places it down and continues with her life like she held something cold. But she did not start like that. The first time she did that, she placed the clay pot on the ground. She shook her fingers because she felt the pain. The next time she did that, she licked her fingers to try and make them feel a bit better. But she kept on doing that until the nerves died. And when the nerves are dead, now she can afford, as if the clay pot is cold, she can afford to hold it and put it on the ground. That is what sin does to your heart. You keep doing it. It will stop telling you this is sin. It's now used to what you are used to. You have stifled your conviction. So while your heart still beats, repent from your sin. Are we together, church of God? Repent from your sin. What you need to notice, if we read Judges chapter 3, verse 12. Let's read together. Judges chapter 3, verse 12. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. Do you see how God reacts to sin? He may react by putting you in an uncomfortable situation. And that is because of his love. He loves you so much that he will send storms in your life to remind you of your waywardness. Ask Jonah, he will tell you, that when he went the other way, when he was supposed to go the other, God raised a storm. Chapter 1, verse 4. And God sent a storm. So there are two types of storms that come in anyone's life. The first one is the storm of purification. You have done nothing wrong, but God allows problems in your life to take you from one level of faith to another. That was experienced by the three Hebrew boys. They had done nothing wrong, but they were put in the fire. Daniel experienced that. There are moments in life, it's not every time that you fall into problems that you have done something wrong. No, God may allow it to purify you, but there is a storm of correction. When you go your own way, and yet you know that you're not supposed to go there, God will raise problems to remind you of where you need to be. And this is what God kept on doing in the book of Judges. And so as we read the book of Judges, we are told now it was time to, to displace the Canaanites. Israel is now supposed to take over their land. And they must keep driving them out until they inhabit the whole of Canaan. And we are told that they went before the Lord. And they asked, who shall go up for us against the Canaanites first? Chapter 1, verse 1. 
And the Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have delivered the land into his hand. And so the Bible tells us that Judah went in companionship with Simeon. They went and they began to drive nations out. But as you are reading, you will be told that they managed to drive out the Canaanites who lived on high mountains. Those ones, they managed to drive. But all the Canaanites that, in, that inhabited the valley, they failed to do that. And the Bible gives us the reason. They saw that these Canaanites have iron chariots. Are we together, church? He drove out every other inhabitant in the mountains, everywhere else. But to fight against those that dwelt in the valley, it was an uphill task for Judah. And he shrank from duty because the challenge was with iron chariots. And before you blame him for anything, let me tell you how these things happened. The children of Canaan, they learned how to use horses and chariots in wars from the Hittites. And so what they would do, they would make their rims and wheels of iron and their frames of iron. But on the side of each wheel, on the side of each wheel, they would place a two-edged blade one meter long. Picture the chariot. It's being driven or being pulled by two horses. And one man is on the chariot. And as the wheels are moving, the blades are turning. And they cut from both ends. So what they would do is, the first thing they would do when fighting an enemy, they would simply drive their iron chariots amongst your soldiers. And guess what the blades would do? They would simply amputate from the knee down. Cut off the legs. Cut off all legs. And the soldiers that will come, the foot soldiers of the Canaanites, would just come and finish up. Because your soldier is trying to run away, but he's running away with his hands. He has no legs anymore. And so they would just come and finish up. And so Judah saw this, and he told himself, I stand no chance against an army that has iron chariots. And he shrank from duty. I stand no chance. But you need to understand that. In verse 2, what had God said? Judah shall go up, but I have delivered. If you were here yesterday, we explained this. I have delivered. It's called prophetic perfect tense. That's what it's called. It has not yet happened, but God has completed the action. Ah. I have, you are yet to go for war. The soldiers of Israel, with, it, with their Barak and their Deborah, they are yet to go for war, but the Lord is done. So God is speaking from a place of completion. He is saying, this issue, I am done dealing with it. I'm actually looking for the next one. You follow up and just do what remains. I'm done. I have delivered. But Judah is afraid to do what the Lord is done doing already. Do I have a witness in this church? You also need to notice in verse number 19, verse number 10, 19 begins by saying, and the Lord was with Judah. Yes, he has iron chariots before him, but the Lord is with him. So he looks at the weapons of the Canaanites and he looks around at their arsenal. He looks at their technological advancement. He looks at their cavalry and then he forgets the promise of God. That's what we do all the time. We face problems. We look around. We see the situation. We look around, but we don't look up. Are we together, church? Come with me to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 20. And listen to God promising Israel. Deuteronomy, all these things Judah knew. Number one, the Lord has delivered this. Number two, he is with us. And the third tangible evidence, what does the Bible say? Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 1 to 4. When you go out to battle against your enemies, and you see horses and chariots, this is the book of Deuteronomy, and a people more than you are, be not afraid of them, for the Lord your God is with you. 
He brought you out of the land of Egypt. Let's continue reading. And it shall be when you have come close to the battle that the priest shall approach and speak unto the people and shall say unto them, Hear, O Israel, you approach this day into battle against your enemies. Let not your hearts faint. Fear not. Do not tremble. Neither be ye terrified because of them. What's the reason? Verse number four. For the Lord your God is he that goes with you to fight for you against your enemies and to save you. Judah knew this. He knew that the moment I step into battle, God has gone before me. All I'm doing is just picking up the pieces. The Lord is done fighting. But even in the face of all that evidence, he shrank because of iron chariots. Are we here at church? He shrank. God is with him, God has delivered, and God has promised. But Judah shrinks from duty. All this tangible evidence. So you will notice that on one side, there was divine help. On the other side, there were material obstacles. On one side, there was infinite power. And on the other side, there were finite mortal beings. On one side was omnipotence. The all power of God, his omniscience, the God who knows everything. And on the other side, there is mortal humanity who do not know anything. Technological superiority on the side of the Canaanites, but God himself on the side of Judah. But still with all that, he shrinks because of iron chariots. Judah looked at the weapons of the enemy and forgot that God is present. And that's what we always do. The temptation was too severe, but was God not with you? Did he not promise to be with you? So every time we come across a difficult times, I want us to take these chariots of iron as the difficult moments of our lives. We come across such. Life is like that. Steeps and slopes. Sometimes it's okay, sometimes it's not. It doesn't matter if you worship or you don't. It's the way of life. We are on this side of the earth. Things can go south anytime they decide to go south. But when that happens, people of God should know that God has promised his presence all the time. And that he has power over the iron chariots of our lives. Now, if you continue following this issue of iron chariots, in the book of Judges, you will not miss the story of Deborah and Barak. Chapter number four, that's where we are now. Because of these problems that we have, I just want to take a moment to remind you what your God can do. That when you walk out of this door, you may walk in confidence, your head held up high, knowing that I have a God who has power over iron chariots. Judges chapter 4, verse number 13 to verse number 17. That's what we're going to read. What is happening here? The children of Israel sin. And God allows them to be sold into the hands of Jabin, the king of Canaan. And there they are oppressed, enslaved, and they don't like it anymore. And number three says, verse number three says, children of Israel cried to the Lord. Why are they crying? He had 900 chariots of iron. Ah. The problem surfaces again. Jabin has chariots, and they are not ordinary chariots. They are 900. So even if Israel decides to fight against Jabin, they can't because of what he owns. They can't because of his cavalry. And so they cry to the Lord. But what does God do? God raises Deborah. Barak goes to Deborah and he says, if you are not going to this war with me, then I will not go. And so Deborah says, let's go. But you need to know that the victory of this war will be recorded against the name of a woman. Let's go. And so they go. And I will read for you from verse number 13. And Sisera gathered together all his chariots, even 900 chariots of iron, and all the people that were with him from Harosheth of the Gentiles unto the river of Kishon. And Deborah said unto Barak, up, for this is the day in which the Lord has delivered Sisera into your hand. And so Barak takes 10,000 soldiers 
And they are used to hiding in mountains and in caves. And so they hide in mountains around the valley. And when they are hiding there, Deborah shouts from the valley. And she says, come down from the, from the mountains. Come to the valley. But I want you to listen what she says. She says, for this is the day. I want you to notice what we call tense shift. Okay. What did I say? Tense? She says, this is the day in which the Lord, what do you expect? Huh? What I expect is this is the day in which the Lord will, because we are yet to fight. Huh? But what does Deborah say? <laughs> this is the day in which the Lord has. Ah. God is done. It now remains for the Israelites to do what they have to do, but God is done. <laughs> so what Deborah is saying is, I'm presenting before Lovington Church a divine warrior. And what this divine warrior does is, he marches before his people. He is ahead, onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war. Christ, the royal master, he leads against the foe. He is in, you come after him. So Deborah is saying, our God is a divine warrior. He goes before you and he defeats the enemy for you. And then he hands over the territory to you. That's what Deborah is telling us. So you see that tense shift, it's helping us to understand that God is already done. It's called prophetic perfect tense. God is already done even though it's yet to be done. And so you will notice that as soon as Deborah had said that, the Bible in verse 14 says, so Barak went down. And verse number 15 says, God. I want you to notice this. All that Barak does is, go, does is going down. And that's it. And after he has gone down from the mountain, God takes over. Ah. So who's doing the fighting? But all that Barak and his soldiers have to do is to show up. They just have to, they, they have to be willing. And when they show their willingness, God takes over. All you need to do in this war and battle of mission, evangelism, whatever challenges you are facing, you just need to show your faith and God will take over. He is calling you to take a step of faith. Yes, I know you are unemployed and they are calling you to work on Sabbath. Your step of faith is not going to work on Sabbath, is of coming to church on Sabbath. That's your step of faith. And when you have done that, you have come down off Mount Tabo, and God will take over. Amen. Let me tell you your step of faith. Your step of faith is to terminate that relationship, young lady, with that young man who does not know the Lord. That's your step of faith. And God will take over. <laughs> God is good. And the Bible says, and the Lord discomfited. That word simply means he confused the enemy. He threw them into a pandemonium, confusion. And they did not understand what was happening. What you need to know is that chapter 4 is the narration of the war. But chapter 5 is the song of victory because of the war. So in chapter 5, that's where we get an idea of how God overcame. Deborah, as she sings, she says, God raised a storm. You need to remember they are in the valley. Okay? And God raises a storm. And the storm wets the clay soil. And it turns into a quagmire of sticky sand. And because the ground is now sticky, the horses cannot run, neither can the wheels of the chariots. Ah. You see how God fought? Nature. God's ever obedient servant. 
When God calls nature to action, nature comes quickly. God simply opened the heavens and allowed the rains to come down into the valley. And that alone, the chariots of iron and their horses were disempowered, immobilized. And that was Sisera's weapon of mass destruction. But God says, I will take your weapon, put it in my pocket, and save my people. And so God simply disabled the wheels of chariot. If you, if, if you read, you continue reading, verse number 17 will say, However, Sisera fled away on his feet. Ah. Where have your chariots gone to, Sir Sisera? Jab in your boss is waiting for you to report a victory over the foot soldiers of Judah. But the God of heaven, in whom Judah trusts, has fought for his people, immobilized the weapons, and allowed a victory to be on his people. I want to tell you this today. Whatever challenge it is you have, take a step of faith, and God will immobilize the situation on which your problem rides on to come to you. That's what God does. That's what God does. In World War II, a war was fought somewhere around that place. And they said, a quarter an hour of rain, serious rain, 15 minutes, there is no donkey or horse that can be able to walk on that valley. And that's just what God did. He made sure that the dry ground turns into mud, and that's the end. You will notice that the, the, the soldiers of Sisera, the valley would, would continue approaching a certain close like that. So no one made it behind the valley. They all died within the valley. And God discomfited Sisera. Now, this is what I like. Judges chapter number three is a narration of how the war was fought. You follow? Judges chapter 5 is a song celebrating the victory in chapter 4. You know what that reminds me of? It reminds me of Exodus 14 and Exodus 15. <laughs> Exodus 14 is a narration of the war. And Exodus 15 is a song celebrating victory of the war. And chapter 15 of Exodus begins exactly the same way, verbatim, with Judges chapter 5, except the names. Judges chapter 5, verse 1, then sang Deborah and Barak. Exodus chapter 15, verse 1, then sang Moses and the children of Israel. What is happening in Exodus chapter 14? The children of Israel are camping at the sea. That's where they are, camping at the sea. And Pharaoh gets to know that they seem to have no way out. What does he do? Exodus chapter 14, verse 5 to 7. I will read that one for you. And it was told the king of Egypt that the people fled, and the heart of Pharaoh and of his servants was turned against the people. And they said, why have we done this? That we have let Israel go from saving us, and he made ready his chariot and took his people with him. Listen to verse number seven. He took 600 chosen chariots. We are tracing chariots today. And he took 600 chosen, not any, but chosen. So I picture Pharaoh standing, expecting one chariot after the other. That one needs a little surfacing. Remove it. Or oh, that one is good. Can you go there? Come back. I think it's good. It's wheels just need grease. And he did that. 600 chariots. And then he said, now let's follow these people. They cannot run from us. You need to understand that this Pharaoh is called Tutmos the third. Tutmos is explained as the narrow of the Old Testament. If you want to find out how cruel Nero was, go and find a book called The Acts of the Apostles written by Ellen White and read the chapter called Paul Before Nero. Nero had vineyards, but he did not want to see his vines and his vineyard during daytime. He wanted to do it during the night. And so he would take Christians, put them on poles, set them on fire, and use that light to eat his grapes. That's Nero. And if you were asked, how do you want to die? Do we inject you <laughs> with cancer or we send you to Nero? People would say, give me cancer. 
Nero, no. And he was that cruel. And this man here, Tutmos the third, this Pharaoh who is following after the children of Israel is called the Nero of the Old Testament. And this man is known not to have ever lost any battle. And when he heard that the children of Israel are stuck by the sea, he said, my gods stay in the water. So I'm going to overcome. And so he gets on his chariot. He charges towards the children of Israel. But little does he know that there is a God in the sky who has power over chariots. <laughs> now read verse number four, chapter 14, verse number 24 and 25 with me. Verse number 24 says, And it came to pass that in the morning, this is the time when God opened the sea and people walked all night across the Red Sea. And when it was about the morning, the Bible says the morning watch. What is the morning watch? You understand this if you study the Romans and how they, they, they consider time. From 6 to 9 o'clock, they call it evening. From 9 to 12 o'clock, they call it night. And from 12 to 3, that's, that one, they call it cock crow. And from 3 to 6, that's what they call the morning watch. So God is in the cloud. And it's just about, this is the same time that Jesus came walking on water, Matthew chapter 14, to relieve the disciples. Same time, it was about the morning watch. And the Bible says, it came to pass that in the morning watch, the Lord looked unto the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and of the cloud and troubled the host. Now, when I read this text, I paused. And I asked myself, how so? Because chapter 13 Verse 21 going down, it will take you that, tell you that there was a pillar of cloud by day huh? and, a, and that of fire by, but in the morning, God has both. Ah. He is in both the pillar of cloud and that of fire. And he acts as if he's opening a curtain just, just to peep and see what's happening with his people. And he sees a foe following what on the heels of his children. And I picture him asking the angels to say, who are those? And the angels saying, we don't know them. And then God says, let's do to those we don't know what we do to those we don't know. And the Bible in verse number 25 says, and God took off their chariot wheels. <laughs> oh my God. Why is Pharaoh coming fast upon the children of Israel? They are on chariots. And what does God do? He takes the wheels off. I like my mind to, I just let it run riot sometimes to say, it must have been angels, man. You know, because when the Bible says God buried Moses, Ellen White says they were the angels who dug the grave and buried Moses. So it's God through the angels doing this. I picture angels undoing the screws, holding the wheels to the chariots and putting those screws and, and nuts in their pockets. And then they say, we are done. And they say, let them drive. The wheels just started falling off one after the other until the Egyptians said, let us flee from the face of Israel for God is fighting for them. And I have news to remind you, whatever chariots you are facing, there is a God who fights for you. There's a God who fights for you. It doesn't matter how strong the chariot is. There is a God who fights for you. All you need to do when the sea is opened, don't ask too many questions. What happened? What, is this, this scientific? How can water separate? No, 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 no. Take a step of faith and God will do the rest. Take a step of faith and God will do the rest. And so you will learn that Israel overcome at the sea. The Red Sea, because God discomfited the Egyptians. How can you not have faith in such a God? I'm asking you. How can you worry? Why look for false prophets? Why look for traditional healers? Why are you going about bribing people to get a job when you have a God who can take wheels off chariots? How do you afford to do that? Have you forgotten what your God can do? It's your marriage. It's your husband. God created that husband. He can change him overnight. 
Why do you have to cook him to stay soft? Why do you have to do that? Why do you have to be in relationships with people that you're not supposed to be in relationships with? It's your chariot of iron, but there is a God who has power over it. And I see young people here, young men, your chariot of iron is your inferiority complex. You are single because you are afraid. But your God is able. And young ladies in church end up thinking there are no men in church. They are there, but they are afraid. But God has power over your iron chariot. Amen. You want to find out what kind of chariots God has? Come with me to the book of Psalm chapter 68. God has his own chariots. His own special kind of chariot. Psalm chapter 68. Let's read together verse 17. The chariots of God are 20,000. He gives a number. And then he says, even thousands of angels. Ah. God's chariots have wings. <laughs> God's chariots can speak. God's chariots, when they are discharged to do duty, they do it faithfully and righteously. The chariots of God are angels. That's what the psalmist tells us. The chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. The Lord is among them, as in Sinai, in the holy place. And these chariots, when they are sent to take care of you, they do a diligent duty. And so, John Yates, taken from the book of First John chapter 5, faith is the victory. That offer. That's all God is asking for from you. Step out in faith. Don't look around. Don't consider the chariots. Don't consider the horses. Don't mind the blades. I know things are not well, but look up by faith. And so John Yates penned this song. Encamped along the hills of light. Ye Christian soldiers rise. Press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies. Against the four in veils below, let all our strength be held. Faith is the victory that we know that overcomes the world. His banner over us is love. Our sword, the word of God. We tread the road, the saints above with shouts of triumph trod. By faith, they, like a whirlwind's breath, swept over Every field, the faith by which they conquered death is still our shining shield. On every hand, the four we find, drawn up in dread array. Let tents of ease be left behind, and onward to the fray. Salvation's helmet on each head, with truth gird about. The earth shall tremble beneath our tread, and echo with our shout. Listen to this one. To him that overcomes, to him who has faith. To him who practices faith, what is going to happen? White raiment shall be given. Before the angels, he shall know his name shall be confessed in heaven. Then onward from the hill of light, our hearts with love are flame. We will vanquish all the hosts of night in Jesus' conquering name. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. These two things cannot stay in one heart, faith and fear. They can't. The moment you are afraid, faith is gone. And the moment you have faith, fear is gone. But you see what fear does? It blocks your vision to see the great things that God has prepared for you. But faith builds a bridge for you to cross over to the good things that God has prepared for you. One writer said, God in his goodness is constantly looking for opportunities to give good gifts to men and women. Yet because of their lack of faith, they forfeit these blessings. When Christians fail to trust God, demanding assurance when God has already spoken, they lose out on the opportunity to be effective instruments of God. You lose out. Step out in faith and see what your God will do for you. I want to pray with someone tonight who is saying, I see and I have seen them. Like Judah, I have seen iron chariots and I am afraid. I am shrinking from duty. 
could be economic, it could be social, it could be spiritual. I want to pray with you. You rise to your feet if you need this special prayer. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. Heavenly Father, we come before your throne, thanking you for the encouragement from your word. But before you fight for us, you want us to take a step of faith. And that's all you ever require from us. Yes, we know that your presence does not dispense of human effort. You want us to do what we can do. But when we have done what we can do, there is always a part that you alone can do. God and men unlimited. How I pray this evening. We are facing different kinds of iron chariots. And some of these make our hearts tremble. Some of these have sent us to the houses of traditional healers. Some of these have made us to be in relationships that we know for sure we're not supposed to be. Some of these things have made us do our businesses in the way that we know you don't want business to be done. But here we are. We have come to you, the God of forgiveness. Forgive us our sins. Cleanse us of our unrighteousness and give us a new page on which to start. And as we go forward as soldiers of the cross, when these chariots come before us, we don't look down, we look up. Because we know you already have a solution and you are already done with the problem. You are just waiting for us to take a move. Bless my mother over there. Bless my father over there, my brother and my sister. Watch over them with your eye that never blinks. I pray that you may bless them as we go back to our homes. I even pray for the requests that have been put in the prayer box. You know what has been written there. And you already know how you're going to deal with it. Shower your children with the blessings that they are asking for. Most importantly, the gift of patience. To wait on you as you deal with our issues. This is our humble prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor, for the reminder that God is fighting for us. And all we have to do is just take a step of faith. I'll now invite our choristers for our closing song, 608. Let's all rise.
Good evening. Uh, what do you say for the powerful session and the sermon from our pastor? Uh, thank you so much for coming this evening, and we invite you tomorrow. Also, come with a friend if possible. And now I'd like to invite Pastor Kirika to close for us with a word of prayer. Shall we pray, our Father and our Master, thank you for reminding us that beyond our circumstances, you have already assured us victory. Enable us to believe. As we walk home, we pray that may that word be digested in our hearts, that it will become a principle to live by, so that, Father, we'll walk in this journey with confidence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.